Hello fellow intelligent investors, my name is René Zalman and today I want to talk about how you can quickly, within 5 to 10 minutes, determine whether a stock is worth your time and digging into further or whether you will be better off by getting rid of the idea immediately. I honestly think that the step-by-step -step guide that I will share with you in this video is incredibly valuable, especially if you are just starting to invest. So please stay tuned and let's get started. Have you ever wondered how you can make your hard-earned money work for you? Have you ever dreamed of building generational wealth and leaving a legacy? My name is René Zellman and I'll teach you how you can manage and invest your money with confidence, a long-term vision and without losing your mind. Join me on my journey of intelligent investing and learn how smart people can compound their money effectively and accumulate wealth. Alright, hello guys. You know, I'm a big fan of Peter Lynch and one of my favorite or most favorite quotes from him is the following. The person that turns over the most rocks wins the game. And he's right. Investing requires a certain amount of yeah, dedication to achieve good, to achieve superior results. Because at the end of the day, those turning over the most rocks, those reading the most 10Ks, so that's annual reports, those reading the most shareholder letters and those who actively track what some of yeah, the very smart people on Twitter share. Well, I believe those will learn the most, they will analyze the most businesses, so stocks, and they will generally do best when it comes to investing returns. Now, another very powerful quote that I would like to reference in the context of this video is by Charlie Munger. He said, the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. And he also said, the wise ones bet heavily when the world offers them that opportunity. They bet big when they have the odds. And the rest of the time, they don't. It's just that simple. So what does Jolly Munger mean by that? Well, I personally, I wholeheartedly believe that the biggest edge you as an individual investor have is to do nothing for long periods of time. And if you are already investing, you will probably know how hard it is. And I'm not even sure if you can acquire the yeah, skill to do nothing. Maybe you just need a certain temperament. I guess my point is that in order to do very little, to make maybe two, one to three investments a year, you need to be incredibly selective because most ideas will A, not pass your business quality threshold. Or B, they pass your quality test, but they are simply not available at an attractive price that yeah, would allow you to generate alpha. So that means to gain an edge that allows you to beat the market. I think if you look at 10 companies, you might find one company that is worth taking a closer look at. You can probably immediately reject the other nine firms as they are simply not worth your time. Now, if you look at 20 companies, you might find two companies that are interesting. And if you look at 100 companies, you will maybe find 10 companies and eventually you might uh, end up investing in only one of those 100 companies. Warren Buffett has said the same thing. When he started, he went through the yeah, Moody's manual, page by page, 20,000 pages in total. Back then, the Moody's manual was the ultimate stock market resource and listed every single yeah, publicly traded company in the United States. And obvious, obviously, Buffett's results speak for themselves. Now all of this inspired me to come up with a framework that allows me to quickly screen for high quality companies, that allows me to filter the ideas that I come across on a daily basis. And a great influence in developing this, yeah, I call it snap judgment framework, were the guys from Focus Compounding. I would think that you have probably never heard of them, but the two of them, so that's Joff and Andrew, they run a pretty popular podcast and they also started an investment fund in 2018 that is primarily focused on small and illiquid stocks. In 2019, the two of them released a podcast episode titled The Secret to Snap Judgments, why 95% of the stocks are worth your time. And essentially, the two of them outlined a framework that is very similar to the one that I'm about to present in this video. So let me just show you a short clip from that podcast episode. Okay, so the idea for this um, podcast basically came from uh, reading a uh, Graham and Doddsville interview yeah. with Pabrai. Um, and uh, he said two things that were really interesting. One thing he said was that he's very good at making quick judgments about things. 
uh, but he's not necessarily better than anyone else making uh, slower judgments about things. So that was the thing about snap judgments. But the other thing he said is basically that he looks at 100 companies and maybe three of them are good, you know, uh, at most or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And that's true. And that, that's my experience too. You look at a lot of companies and very few. Now, when you say like he he's looking at companies, I mean, what does that mean? He's looking from a bird's eye view. He's looking at like like what we may do with QuickFS, the financials, is that he's actually reading about the companies. I mean, what does right. that mean? So it could mean um, that you're looking at the like QuickFS.net. You're looking at the financials you're looking at like 10-year summary finance yeah. things like that it could mean you're reading a description of the business and learning a little bit about it all right before i move on if you enjoyed the content that i put out on my channel and if you want to learn more about the art of intelligent investing you could support me by just quickly hitting the like button by subscribing to the channel of course or by leaving a comment this only takes a few seconds but it truly really goes a long way in yeah supporting my channel now let's turn to my framework here I just said that a person that is turning over yeah, many rocks is more likely to yeah, generate great returns than a lazy person that maybe only looks at five stocks a year. And I can imagine that some of you might be wondering now that or thinking that looking at say 10, 20 or 30 companies a month is a lot of work that is yes, hard to do yourself. Well, and of course it is a lot of work, but having the ability to reject ideas quickly makes the whole process much easier and much, a much less challenging task. I truly really believe that it is your job as an investor to reject your ideas very quickly. You want to focus on the no-brainers. And if you can do that, if you can disqualify companies quickly and ident identify those that are worth looking at closer, well, then you can uh, easily look at 30 companies a month, even if you only have, say, a few hours per week. I think you can think of it like an 80-20 rule. 80% of the most useful information can be captured in the first 20% of the time that you spend analyzing a company. Let me quote Martin Whitman here. Rarely do more than three or four variables really count. Everything else is noise. So I think my framework that should help you disqualify businesses quickly can be divided into two sets of criteria or questions. There are some qualitative criteria and a good handful of quantitative criteria that I use when making yeah, snap judgments. So let me start with the qualitative set of criteria. So I would say the first question that you need to ask yourself is, will I be able to understand the business model if I put in the work? Is the industry in my circle of competence or am I excited about becoming an expert in it? You have to be brutally honest with yourself here. You have to admit that you will have a hard time truly understanding the vast majority of businesses. For example, personally, I will never be able to understand biotech companies. So I just get rid of these companies very quickly. I don't even con consider these stocks at all. I don't truly really understand the products they offer. I have no biochemistry degree and probably most of, you, most of you don't have such a degree. Personally, I have a hard time predicting yeah, FDA appro approvals. And maybe most importantly, I also have no interest in learning more about this specific industry. I think some ideas should simply be put in yeah, your too hard box. And I think too hard means two things. Uh, first of all, it means you don't understand the business model, the products, the industry, and maybe the competitive landscape. And secondly, it means you don't know how to value the stock, as you cannot predict, at least not with a high degree of certainty, where the business is going to be 10 years from now. Personally, I believe what is more important than understanding a dozen of different industries is knowing which industries you do not understand and to stick to those business models where you are fairly confident that you are yeah, capable of understanding the business. So what I will do when I come across a new stock idea, I will simply head to QuickFS or Seeking Alpha and take a brief look at the business description and then decide if I stop right away or continue with my snap judgment framework. So if I do think that I can understand the business, I quickly try to assess whether the business might have a moat and pricing power. I think I talked about the importance of pricing power in my recent video on inflation risk. And I think if you are familiar with the most important competitive advantages, so that would be intangible assets such as brand patents or regulatory licenses, or trademarks maybe. Switching costs, network effects, or scale advantages, 
then you can already disqualify many business models by simply reading the business description. Obviously, assessing the strength of a firm's moat, its competitive advantage, is an art and it's obviously a little more complex than I make it seem here. But I think generally speaking, whether or not a firm has a competitive advantage can be pinned down to just one question. And that question is, does the company compete on price alone? Or is there really a unique selling proposition that allows the business to maintain a competitive edge? And based on this question, I can immediately reject almost all commodity businesses, for example. And then one third qualitative factor that I like to consider is whether a company will benefit from strong secular growth drivers, say over the course of the next 10 years. So just to give you an example here, I believe that there are a number of secular tailwinds that will help support the growth in the video game industry over the next yeah, couple of years, five to 10 years, I would say, as install bases, install bases are growing, um, in-game expenditures become more common and there's generally yeah, an increased level of engagement. So that was the qualitative part of my framework. Let's focus on the quantitative part of the framework, so the cold hard numbers. And as I promised, all of this shouldn't take you much longer than five minutes. So my first quantitative criterion is, has the company been consistently profitable for a number of years? Luckily, the free version of QuickFS provides 10 years worth of financial data if the company has been public for 10 years or more. And I usually look at both operating income, which you can find on the income statement, and free cash flow, which you can calculate yourself by heading to the cash flow statement, and then subtracting the number you can find in the purchase of property, plant, and equipment line from the firm's cash flow from operations. Alternatively, you can also head to the key ratio section, as QuickFS actually does the calculation for you, and you can find the yeah, free cash flow metric under the uh, supplementary items category. Now obviously you can also make money by investing in firms that aren't profitable yet. Businesses that yeah, cannot self-finance their operations yet, but will generate cash flows for their owners in the future when they are maybe more mature. But that's just not my type of thing, not my investment style, as I have a very hard time valuing companies that do not generate cash profits yet. So I just stick to consistently profitable businesses and whenever I have diverged from yeah, that principle, actually have once, yeah, then I never really felt comfortable in my investments. Okay, next up we're going to head to the balance sheet because our next question is, does the company have a lot of debt and is the debt load manageable? For starters, the balance sheet is a statement of a firm's assets, liabilities and yeah, maybe net worth. Essentially, the balance sheet is what you personally on an individual level would see when you check your bank account. It provides a snapshot of a business at a point in time. So you always want to consider the most recent numbers here, the latest data point available. And as a rule of thumb, I want the debt to equity ratio to be below one and the firm's debt should not exceed three to four years worth of free cash flow. The next I want to consider whether the company has bought back its, its own stock over the course of say the last 10 years or if there has been any dilution of equity. We need to head back to the income statement. And generally speaking, speaking, I prefer companies that reduce the number of fully diluted shares outstanding over time, or where the number of shares outstanding is at least flat. If the number is slightly increasing over time, this is not necessarily a red flag, depending on the bigger picture. And yeah, I would say maybe the stage uh, the business is in, in, in the context of its yeah, life cycle and also the firm's growth uh, trajectory. So this brings us to my next item and that is growth. And I think this one is important as especially new investors tend to be attracted to companies that are trading at low multiples, low valuation multiples. But oftentimes these kinds of businesses are cheap for a reason and you can easily end up in what is commonly referred to as a value trap. The question to consider here is, how has the company performed historically? Was the company able to grow revenue, free cash flow, EBIT, so that is operating income, and earnings per share over the last, say, five to 10 years? And at what rate was the firm able to grow? Here I place a lot of emphasis on revenue growth. 
and QuickFS provides the 10-year compounded annual growth rates for free cash flow, revenue and earnings per share. So that is certainly a good starting point here for our snap judgment process. But I certainly also take into account more recent growth rates and yeah, in particular three or five year uh, growth averages. Moreover, I also like to take into account whether the stock has actually beaten the S&P 500 since its IPO or over the course of the last five years. Usually I ignore stock prices and I focus solely on the business. But from my experience, I can tell that, yeah, broadly speaking, speaking, winners keep on winning and losers keep on losing. So that's why I briefly look at the stock chart of that specific company as well. Okay, there are three more items on my yeah, snap judgment checklist. Another one is, has the company achieved high returns on capital? And what I'm looking for here is not just good returns on capital in just a single year, but it's the consistency of above average returns on capital, yeah, what really matters here. Two metrics that might actually be the most important, important metrics in all of investing are return on equity, so that's ROE, and return on invested capital, or short ROIC. A good rule of thumb here is to consider the long-term average of the S&P 500 as an yeah, acceptable benchmark. In 2020, as what Demo Demeron, who is a professor at NYU. He actually calculated the average return on equity for the 500 S&P 500 companies. And he determined that the market average is a little more than 13%. And historically, the average US company has generated returns on invested capital of about 10%. So what I'm personally looking for here is a minimum of 15% and the higher the better. And again, you can find these two metrics on QuickFS. You can find both the 10-year median returns, but also the returns for individual years on the overview page. Okay, next up I look at the firm's margins. And ideally we like to see high increasing or at least stable margins. But again, lower margins are not necessarily a red flag. Just look at Amazon's margins, for example. Amazon is a remarkable, remarkable business and it possesses many competitive advantages. But nonetheless, generally speaking, above average margins are an indicator of superior business quality and pricing power. And then the last thing I do in my snap judgment process is consider the EV to free cash flow and the EV to EBIT multiple. So what does the current valuation look like? Obviously, Valuing businesses is more art than science, and you can hardly assess whether a company deserves to trade at a relatively high multiple without a good qualitative understanding of the business. And that, of course, requires yeah, more than just a snap judgment. You would have to consider the management as well and the firm's run rate for growth and obviously many other aspects. But I'm a simple guy and generally I am very careful when it comes to companies that are trading at very high multiples. But just to be clear here, I think value investing does not mean that an, an, a value investment needs to carry a low valuation multiple. And a high valuation multiple doesn't necessarily imply that yeah, an, a stock is overpriced. No, in fact, a business that is trading at a high multiple might be the superior investment, as it indicates higher growth prospects and yeah, superior business quality. But our time as investors is of course limited but I think it can be worth it to analyze a great business in depth that is currently yeah, massively overpriced. We sometimes have to prioritize our time. And obviously, we can only focus on one business at a time. So let's say I find two attractive, high-quality companies that I would like to have a closer look at. And I know that one of these two businesses is trading at an EV to revenue multiple of 35. Well, then I'm pretty sure that this stock will yeah, very likely not trade anywhere a price point that I would consider yeah, an attractive entry price. And so I might focus my attention on the other high quality company. I think there's simply not enough time to investigate every single company trading on a public stock market. All right, and that's my snap judgment framework. By using this framework, I think you will very likely be able to eliminate 95% of the companies that you are looking at within five minutes. And I would like to close this video with a quote from yeah, Ray Dalio. He said, you've got to get the basic fundamentals crystal clear. 
Someone said that any damn fool can make it complicated. It takes a genius to make it simple. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let me know if you have any questions regarding this framework in the comment section down below. And as always, may your finances and investments prosper. Good luck.